Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. My guests today are two representatives of the North Carolina General Assembly, one Democrat and one Republican, who disagree on many issues of policy, but have found a way to work together constructively in a very polarized state house. Becky Carney is a Democrat who has represented Mecklenburg County for the past 16 years. John Torbett is a Republican who has represented Gaston County since 2011. Together, they lead the House Transportation Committee, and they recently participated in a Braver Angels town hall. As Braver Angels takes its work from the grassroots into the political arena, I wanted to bring these two on to discuss what's possible when politically opposed officials find ways to work together in a spirit of trust and goodwill. But before we get into their current efforts in the State House, I wanted to give each of them a chance to talk about their own politics and the experiences that have shaped their views. So Representative Carney, I'll start with you, and then I'll ask Representative Torbett the same question. What life experiences have influenced your values and beliefs about public policy and public service? Well, well, we don't have enough time to go into all that, <laughs> but, um, but there have been some highlights in my life. Uh, and I've said this just about everywhere I've gone. I am currently serving my 10th term in the North Carolina House. I've been there 20 years. And prior to that, I served the County Commission in Mecklenburg County at large for six years. Um, that's when John and I, I think our paths first crossed the county commission days. But prior to that, when um, I tell people that uh, I have been widowed, I've been, I am married, I have been widowed, I have been divorced, and I have had sudden cardiac death experience that so I can check all those boxes. But through that, those adversarial things that have transpired in my life to some people, all good has come from it. I have, uh, I have a perspective uh, of real life living. I have at one point in my life experienced uh, food stamps. So that has led me um, to a position in my life that uh, it's not about me, anything I've done. Um, I have six children, my husband and I have six children. They're all married and we have 14 grandchildren. Those have built, uh, those are part of, of my legacy. And that is what my legacy is, is my family. And through those experience of child rearing days, of volunteering, working jobs, um, I, have, uh, I have that greater perspective of real life living. And that really is what in politics, uh, we should be transferring um, what uh, we know about life and, and knowing that how other people are affected. I wanna tell you that from my perspective of politics, for me, um, I was first exposed to the political arena when there was a bond referendum, school bond referendum in Mecklenburg County and I was the PTO president in a middle school that was in a wealthy part of town. And uh, we had, it was a brand new school, but we opened with trailers. That led to a school bond referendum that countywide, our inner city schools had um, water uh, dripping in their classrooms. They had brown water running from their faucets. So I got involved as a PTO president saying, wait, our school is new. We, there are other needs within the greater good of Mecklenburg County school system. So I was very involved with organizing a grassroots effort around passing that bond uh, referendum in the county and bringing the inner city schools and the suburbs together in rallying uh, for that bond referendum. Um, from there, it was like, and nobody paid attention to your party, didn't matter, because it was for public schools, right? Public education. And it was a need for all sectors of the community. Um, so right after that, that um, election for the referendum, people were calling me saying, you should run for a school board. 
Um, and I went, well, I don't know about that. I'm not, I wasn't in this for, for a political reason as far as office for me, but they convinced me. And I knew that I could not run in a district. It was not in my nature to just represent one segment of a whole. So I ran at large and I came in fourth behind the three incumbents. But I point that out because when I had to go down and file, you had to, um, you know, to file, it was, those were nonpartisan races. But when it came out in the paper that I was a Democrat, people started calling me. I didn't know you were a Democrat. And I said, well, are you, or are you a Republican? Does it matter? And I had an incredible campaign that was bipartisan and it didn't matter to them because they knew what I stood for and they knew who I was and they knew, um, um, they knew who they would be working with if I were elected. Well, I lost that race and turned right around and ran for county commission at large, which was a partisan race. And I still carried forward a lot of that bipartisan support in that election and I won and the rest is history. Fast forward to getting elected to the, to the uh, house and why I believe in, in uh, bipartisanship so strongly. It, it's in every step of my political path that I've taken or that was given to me. Um, when I was elected to the house in Raleigh in 2003, um, we ended up having a historical vote that we had co-speakerships, uh, a Republican and a Democrat. And that's how closely divided our chamber was, 60-60. And one member voted, went and voted over for, three members did. So we had co-speakerships. So from day one for me in Raleigh, there were co-speakers, uh, bipartisanship uh, co-chairs, uh, of committees. Um, my freshman class was comprised of 16 members, equally Democrat, Republican, and we met and worked together and filed bills together. And so I didn't know any better. <laughs> Somebody has said to me, you just didn't know any better. But it was the way that, that it, politics came to me. And it was all in a bipartisan way. <clears throat> and then, um, 10 years after that, then there was another election. <clears throat> My party was in the majority uh, for 10 years and then um, we went into the minority. And that's when I met uh, Representative Torbett, John. Are we on first names on this, this podcast? Uh, that's when I first met John and um, already had known him and, and had interacted with him from county commission days. And so from that day forward, I mean, I knew him, I knew he had integrity. Um, I, I, and that to me is the epitome of a good elected official is your integrity because your word is your bond. And, and I've always experienced that with John, but that's in a, in a quick, quick nutshell about my political journey and how I got where I am and, and why I'm proud of the fact that that I still um, work with uh, my colleagues across the aisle, as we all say, but I say I work with all my colleagues. I do wanna add one little thing though that was interesting. Another uh, colleague of mine, when I was elected, she and I had served on the State Association of County Commissioners Board. And um, when she was elected the same term I was in Raleigh, um, a year after we had had hotel living up to our head, we decided to get an apartment together. So my colleague and I were roommates, a Democrat and a Republican, which was so befitting for, for me. It just worked. And to this day, we're still uh, friends and talk with each other. She's no longer in the house. But anyway, it's, it's just been a good journey for me. And, um, and there's some other comments I'll tie in later as we talk. Hmm. John, AKA Representative Torbett, same question to you. What life experiences have influenced your values and beliefs about <clears throat> public policy and public service? <clears throat> You're muted, John. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Excellent, yeah, I apologize. I uh, just wanted to start off by 
saying what Becky and I both did just last night. We both attended an event at UNC Charlotte or University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where they had two individuals talking to us about higher ed. And those individuals were Secretary Janet Napolitano and Governor Jeb Bush, one Democrat, one Republican. So how apropos that we're having this conversation today coming right off that event last night. But I told Becky at that event, we ought to go off into today and just act like, no, I can't talk to Becky Carney because she's a Democrat. And, and she could say, no, John's dead to me because he's a Republican. But, you know, we just don't get along that way. But that was quite of a chuckle last night. Uh, hey, I, I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. My father was born in 1919. My mother born in 1921, which is if you do the math, that tells you they would both be over 100 years old now. Uh, he went to war uh, during the, in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Mom stayed home. Mom went to work at Tennessee Valley Authority, was present at the groundbreaking of the uh, Chickamauga Dam when FDR came down and celebrated the, the uh, deepening of the uh, shallows, as they called it, on the Tennessee River that from then on brought electrification, which I love that word, throughout uh, the valleys and the hills of Tennessee, as well as uh, kept flooding at, at a, at a kept flooding at bay, if you would, that had been happening every rainy season. So uh, she went to work for TVA and virtually stayed there until, as she would have said, uh, almost in her 70s, they forced me to retire. So uh, uh, that I, I learned all of my, I guess, uh, everything that I think of, I think of my mom and I think of my dad. Uh, that they were, they were strong parents. Mother always told mother she would, uh, she could make a sow's ear out of a silk purse. Now, you know, that's the opposite of what it is, but uh, she, she was kind of a lady that just re worked real hard. And she said, uh, if she won the lottery, she'd say, great, now I got to pay all those taxes on it, you know, that kind of thing. So, but she was just a great loving lady. My, my father uh, was a hard worker. He went to work for US Pipe Foundry. Pretty much he didn't graduate college. He came out of high school, uh, went, to went to the Pacific Theater, came back, went to work at US Pipe and pretty much died working at US Pipe. So he was a, he was a one job individual like most of us were back in the day. Uh, I went to work in the pulp and paper uh, industry, was in the pulp and paper industry for 30 years. Uh, retired from that uh, about the same time I came, uh, about, tw I guess, 2000, about the same time I became a county commissioner, as Becky mentioned. We, our paths are all, a lot aligned. Uh, I was a county commissioner here in Gaston County for eight years prior to uh, becoming a member of the General Assembly. I did meet Becky when we were both county commissioners. Uh, we, our counties are next door to each other, so we have some collaboration uh, as county commissioners. Uh, that, that, was, that was great, really enjoyed it. Uh, was actually in St. Petersburg, Florida, Treasure Island, looking at houses when I got a call from a, a guy named Tom Tillis back then saying, hey, how would you like to come uh, be a member of the North Carolina House of Representatives? I said, well, what do you got to do? He said, well, just go to a few meetings kind of thing. So uh, we, yeah, we, we had that conversation. Uh, we decided not to move to St. Petersburg, Florida, Treasure Island area, and decided to come to Raleigh. It's been a tremendous experience, been there for 12 years. But back up just a little bit, I have one daughter who's 38 years old now, I have two loving grandsons. Uh, I was PTO president, like Becky was at school. I was PTO president of every school my daughter went to, with the exception of high school, because she begged me not to be PTO president of high school, kind of give her an opportunity to get her own identity, if you know what I mean. So in high school, I didn't participate on a day-to-day -day basis up down the hallowed halls of uh, East Gaston High School, but I did I did call their football games every Friday night. So I did have fun and some interaction with the kids in high school that I had got to know all the way through my, my daughter's career. One thing I, I'll mention, Becky was talking about things in education. We're, we're so much alike that uh, I, I would, I was PTO president at Kaiser Elementary School, Stanley, North Carolina, which is a middle elementary school. It's before middle school, but after the early uh, elementary schools. And I was went into the principal. I said, "Yeah, PTO president, what do you need us to do this year?" He said, "I need you to raise six thousand dollars for copy paper." And I said, "Do you not get copy paper from central office?" And they said, "No, they've never furnished us with enough." And each year for the last four or five years, we've had our PTO raise $6,000 for copy paper. And I thought for a second, you know, and I said, uh, you know, I, I can't do that. He said, what do you mean? I said, I, I just, I can't do that. But here's what I will do. I'll work with our team and see if we can't come up with enough money to have the first computer lab at an elementary school in Gaston County Schools. 
And then I was told that we couldn't do that because our school was economically repressed. Uh, but the, the parents would never be able to, to, to come to that, to that level of, of, of giving and working and selling peanuts and selling wrapping paper and just about anything we'd knock on a door to sell the kids were, were willing to do. And he just kind of tried to talk me out of it. I said, well, give me a chance. Give me, just give me a shot. And about six weeks later, we'd raised over $22,000 and we're purchasing the first computers for, for a computer lab at an elementary school in, in Gaston County. Then I get a call from the principal saying, we got problems. I said, what's that? I said, we got nobody that could teach the computer. So I had to go over to the central office and they ended up sending someone from high school over, I think two or three times a day and, and got kids introduced in computer classes. Now. Like I said, that was 30, now my, da my daughter's 38, so you can do the math, that was about 20 some odd years ago. Computers, computers were just on the horizon, but if anybody was paying attention, knew that kids would have to have that basic knowledge of, of, of computer and, and, and working how does a printer work and how does files and how do you, back then working with Microsoft Office, you know, how does all that work in, in, in today's environment? So we got that established and that, that was, that was a, a really a fun time. That was, uh, like I say, that was Kaiser. We went on to the middle school and then exited out uh, through high school is calling the, the games. County commissioner was, was fun. I learned a tremendous amount of information that has proved very useful going to Raleigh. Uh, I was honored to be chair of transportation and how I got to be chair of transportation was uh, then also uh, then Speaker Tillis, who is now U.S. Senator Tillis, uh, Speaker Tillis had given me a, an assignment in healthcare working on certificate of need for 18 months. And if you know anything about politics in North Carolina, healthcare and certificate of need is kind of like the third rail. If you touch it, you'll get electrocuted and, and you won't have much of a long political life if you, if you mess, with, mess with that uh, contingency. So we worked on it and tried to get it and clean it up a little bit. And we did pretty much yeoman's work, but it, it literally wore me out. So when he said the next year, he said, John, would you like a chair of healthcare or transportation? I said, transportation. So I didn't hadn't had my feel with healthcare. So we did that for a decade, uh, and then uh, was pushed in, uh, not pushing. I was asked to take over to uh, education because we had one gentleman that had to uh, run for office in another office statewide and and not got it. So he was no longer in education. And then we had a, I called her the Czar Reign of Education, Representative uh, former Representative Linda Johnson, who passed away in office last session. She was the queen of education. So the speaker came to me and said, I need someone that's been here a while, knows the ropes, got a backbone, smart, intelligent, and can put their heart and mind into it. And so he gave me the appropriations of uh, education, policy education, and also uh, gave me this committee to look at a whole new way of how can we, how can we, or if we had an opportunity to create a new education system, what would that education system look like for the future? And that's what we're that's what we're engaged into. And I say the best for last, I say best, because when I retired from the pulp and paper after 30 years, I was blessed as these two guys came to me and said, hey, you know, we do some work in the Hill. We, we like what you do. We, we, we followed you in politics. We have a, a defense contractor we're working on unmanned systems. They, they knew how to love for aviation. So I spent 10 years working in the Department of Defense uh, as a contractor and with the Army, Navy, NASA, NOAA, uh, the whole gamut of federal agencies working on unmanned system. Then this is before the helicopters, everything was fixed wings, global hawk, predator type stuff, and trying to do everything we could to save warfighters' lives, to give them the opportunity to see what was around the, around the curve or beyond the horizon before they actually had to walk into it. Those were some of the most rewarding uh, years of my life when you talk to guys who were just coming over and still had sand in their shoes and asking them, what can we do to help you survive and, and to make you a, a, a better soldier uh, in, in the war on uh, global war on terror. And with all of our information we got from those guys that had just come over from the sandbox and, and we applied those to unmanned systems, working on air systems, ground systems, sea surface systems and subsea surface systems. And it was really rewarding and they paid me for it anyway. I told them I probably would have done it without any pay at all, it was just so fun. But uh, that, that's pretty much John Torbert in a five or 10 minute snapshot and look forward to uh, the rest of the meeting today. Now, Karen, can I just add one more thing um, that is important to me and something that I've realized just recently um, and hearing John talk and that is when I went to Raleigh, uh, we were in the majority. The speaker of the house was from Charlotte. When John came to Raleigh in 2011, 
Tom Tillis was from Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, and he was the speaker. So we have that parallel. When I was in the majority, I was transportation chair and I was appointed by the Charlotte speaker. And John was appointed by a Charlotte speaker, uh, Republican to the chair of transportation. And that's kind of how we've, we've, we've interacted with each other uh, throughout these years, but never really knowing um, at what point we were gonna really intersect and, and start to impact public policy for, on the state level. So I just thought that was important. How have you seen the culture and environment of the state house change over the course of your time in office? Has it become more partisan? I'll go first on this one. Okay. Uh, I've seen over the years actually become less partisan. When I first came in in 2011, there was a majority minority shift. So in other words, Democrats have been in the majority for a long period of time. Republicans turned that over and Republicans were now in the majority. And that made a lot of people in North Carolina really, really angry. And they come out and voice their anger and opinions almost every every other day of the week, it seems like on, on the mall area around the legislative campus. Then over the years, it seems like that has somewhat waned. It's not to write it. It's not, it's not as an angry place as it was to begin with. So I see it being a little bit more, a little bit more tamer. And what people really need to understand is that a lot of times the noise, the, the, the angry birds, I call them, the people that make the most noise, oftentimes they're profiteering from that noise. So when you see something or hear something or, or, or anger, it's, it's not always that we don't get along. It's just that somebody's earning a living off trying to make it seem like we don't get along. Because you can ask Becky, we go through a thousand bills every, every session. And out of a thousand bills, there may be four or five that we actually have a good solid uh, partisan debate on on the floor. The rest of them, it's just uh, whether, whether you believe in what that bill does or not, whether you're Republican or Democrat, most of them seem to go right on through. And have you seen, and I'll ask Becky this, the, the conversation in the state house become more influenced by national polarized topics, you know, whether that's uh, critical race theory in school or things that are happening at the federal level, have they become more influential at the state level because of media polarization? If they touch the state, yes. Uh, as you know, coming off COVID, everyone was in the COVID uh, business, so to speak, one way or the other. So there was a lot of play on wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, that kind of thing. And that was so unfortunate, so, so important. I hope, I hope that just a small segment of civilization we've understand, understood that, you know, wearing masks or not wearing masks is just really not that, that, that important. People, if you want to wear one, wear one, that type of thing. Uh, and, and the other, the other thing is if there's state level, like for example, if critical race theory impacts the state, yes, it, it, it's become a state issue. Uh, although it may have began at the, at the federal level, it filters down to the state level. So it becomes our issue. Some of the federal issues, uh, we, we don't really address because they're just not in our wheelhouse. So. Mm -hmm. I'd say on your answer your question, so a little bit here, but not so much across the board on everything. Gotcha. Becky, what about you? How would you assess the current environment in terms of the culture and tenor of the conversation across the aisle? Um, well, I'll go back to um, when I first came to Raleigh and the majority and the co-speakerships. And for that term, my first two years there, it was Democrat, Republican working together. And my freshman class, again, we filed bills together. Um, I learned that term and I took it forward. Um, and I still do today. If I'm going to primary a bill, primary sponsor a bill, and in the House, you can have four primary sponsors. And then any member that wants to co-sponsor can sign on. I learned right off the bat that if you want anything passed, then if you have in the House your four members, representing um, the, the perspective of the, the body. And that is, I would have a minority representation. I would have a Republican uh, uh, primary sponsoring with me. And, and that is when, you, when you're really working a bill, um, 
you even though de depending on the, the split of the votes democrat republican to the majority sometimes there are a lot of bills that we pass up there that are voted both democrat and republican and it isn't it's very few that john pointed out on the hot button uh, bills that are party line and we seem to have been having more of those lately and i think prior to COVID, and I'll say it, COVID hit, and we came together as an entire body to address those issues, um, total bipartisanship. Um, so when, uh, I think when the, the shift changed a little bit, when the, from my, my side of the aisle, um, with um, partisanship, and I think that's the perception of maybe with members that had come off of uh, for years being in the majority, almost a hundred years, with the exception of a couple of terms in there where the, uh, we did have a, a Republican um, majority in the house and Speaker Brubaker was serving during that time. But um, it was like a, a shift in, in um, the operational process for members to adjust to. But again, for me and several others that had been there um, in my freshman class, uh, we adjusted and we were able, to, we had already built those relationships. So we were able to continue working together. And there was the, um, the, the move of um, a partisan divide somewhat on, on different issues, but mainly they were the, not letting go of what they we have always known to now it's a new day and there were issues one of the big issues i think that hit with the partisanship uh, was on education which um, seemed to um, agitate a lot of people and you know justified or not um, there were lots of bills that started coming um, before us that dealt with um, making school boards partisan elections. So a lot of bills across the state. And of course, I, I support nonpartisan school board elections because I don't think ed, public education is partisan. I don't think it should be. And, uh, but anyway, that sort of was one of the first sticking points that I saw would build over time. But, but the, the, another thing that did happen that uh, John wasn't, there to experience this as much. Um, and, and that was for my first 10 years, um, we, we broke bread together, Democrats and Republicans, those 10 years. And that was in the day that, that um, we had um, reform on ethics reform that came hard and um, at us, but it was the days of uh, lobbyists would put together Democrats and Republicans to go to dinner. And you didn't, they didn't lobby you. They just set up meetings for us to go and break bread and, and get to know each other. And that was, that is that networking opportunity. And I don't think that we have done as much of that as we should have um, over the last 10 years. We tried the First couple of years, I think, John, the first term that you were there and your freshman class and, and the Democrats uh, tried to continue that type of, of uh, camaraderie. And it still happens occasionally, but not like it was um, every Tuesday and Wednesday night. You'd go to dinner with your colleagues on the other side of the aisle and you talked about who you are and the very thing you started this podcast with. I don't think we do enough of that. I know they can't do that in Washington. It just, I don't think you know, we know each other as well as we have in the past. And, um, but I think we have turned a corner and people are really trying to, you know, go out to dinner, meet, get to know your colleague. I've often said, thought about sitting in that chamber that if I could arrange, stand up there at the podium and arrange that, that, um, the, the, um, our hall there, our house chamber. We now, and it's always been that way, and it, I don't think it'll ever change, but we have two members that share a, a desk. And it's always the Democrats are all on one side and your seatmate is a colleague, a Democrat. 
If you're a Republican, you're on the other side of the aisle. We say this, the other side of the aisle, you all on the other side of the aisle, divisive conversation comments. I've done theater in the past and I've watched those kind of things and I always thought, if I could come in here, I would put a Democrat and a Republican, pick your seatmate, but we're gonna sit together and we're gonna work through issues as they come before us. But some would say, oh yeah, lady, that's not gonna happen and that won't work. And, and I know it won't, I know it won't happen. But so what we do is we, when I go in the chamber, John will tell you, I'm over on the other side of the aisle, conversing and communicating with my colleagues on the other side and several of my colleagues on, in the house do the same. So it's that camaraderie building that's kind of hard to do. John, what do you think are the greatest challenges for bipartisan collaboration right now at the state level for officials like yourselves who are committed to the work, but running up against an environment that is often quite vitriolic? You're muted again, John. I keep forgetting, I'm sorry. Uh, education is a big part of it. Uh, and depending on which side you're on, uh, I reflect back. I'm, I love my history, and I've, I've read quite a bit about it. But you know, back in the in the mid 1800s, we had what equi what equates to uh, middle school students. Now they were uh, studying the Greeks and learning how to write and read Latin, for example. And I, you know, we're just we're not there anymore. We're we're, we're just not that everyone needs Latin granted today, but that was the level of education they were getting back in, in, in pre-electricity days. So it's, I'm frustrated oftentimes that we, we, talk, we talk about education and we talk about the issues and we talk about the concerns and the road roadblocks and the hurdles, but we've been talking for over 20 years about some of the same issues. So I see uh, trying to get both sides focused, uh, I won't say narrowly, but but if you know anything about farming and the mules had the blinders on, you tighten the blinders up so you can, so you can hoe a, a straighter line, if you would, uh, or till a straighter line. And that's what we need to do. We need to get both sides just to tighten up their blinders a little bit. Say, you know, the focus isn't on party here or party there. The focus is on is providing greatest access for success to each and every child coming out of the classroom in education. And you do that, in my humble opinion, based on what I call the trifecta, which is the student, the teacher, and the parent. Focus all your efforts around that classroom, and then everything else from a support structure. And right now, I think we're, we've got that turned upside down. I think we're focused more on a system than we are the, the classroom. So we're going to try to look at that and, and fix that. Uh, the transportation is, is, is not an argument, a red argument or a blue argument. Transportation is a funding argument, which is where you'll see most of our uh, conversations and debate rolling on is that uh, Republicans are, you know, the conservative party and, and the Democrats are, are, are the liberal party or, and uh, that, that's what everybody, the moniker and the tags and, and the bylines and, you know, that they, that their tag would want to be more social spending and we're trying to be about more, more economic spending and structural spending and that's typically where we get in some of the, the hot the hot exchanges that just different viewpoints on that. And what's frustrating is, is I've noticed so much in the last couple of years, Becky kind of, I guess, touched on this. That, uh, and you actually asked a question about the national uh, level and, and input. After thinking about that, it, it's, it's, at least in my perspective, it's odd that if you see something on the nightly news, for example, that's going on in DC, in about a week, you'll start hearing it in, in Raleigh and you'll start seeing it's kind of like, like kind of addressing the words and language and, and newspaper articles and, and op-eds. And so, yeah, I think there is a little trickle down, if you would, to the, of that uh, political uh, bullying, I'll, I'll call it on both sides, Republican and, Dem and Democrat, uh, instead of uh, the work, work towards unification, because I think there's companies out there that believe there's more money to be made if they keep everybody at each other's throat than there is if everybody's working peacefully and getting along. Uh, that's extremely unfortunate, but I do oftentimes think that the almighty dollar is the one that's actually ruling this instead of any one party. So uh, we try to do what we can without focusing on, on, on the uh, 
on the almighty dollar and see what's best for uh, your moms and your dads and your teachers and your doctors and your students and just everybody out there in, in their normal d daily walk of life. Uh, and I'll end there. Hmm. Becky, what do you think that leaders in Washington might be able to learn from your and John's working relationship about how to get things done when you do have policy disagreements? Wow. <laughs> If I had a magic ball and I could look in it right now, <clears throat> I don't know, um, you know, working together. I, I, we, we have several of our colleagues that have been in the house, one that was a freshman with me and she's now in Washington and she's already starting to see that uh, uh, you're not going to get it done on your own. And the numbers are so massive they are the number of congressional members and having to work together and counting your votes. Um, but, you know, there, there are, one of the things I think that started um, a lot of polarizing within education, John, and I don't know if you'll agree or not, but I do know from my perspective was when um, we <clears throat> introduced vouchers, the voucher system, and it Im immediately became uh, tagged as the demise of public education, the funding of it. And that would allow people to go to private schools with taxpayer dollars, a voucher to, to go there. And then it was, they were uh, cap, charter schools came in and it was my party that, that voted to um, enable charter schools. And there was a cap of, of 100 charter schools would be allowed. And <clears throat> the intent of the, the charter school system was to, um, to open up uh, for the public schools to work with them and, and learn from each other. Um, and I think that sort of brought you know, a divide among, with that public education and the increasing of uh, the cap was lifted uh, on, on charter schools and then the, the voucher system took over and, um, and it's been, you know, vouchers, private schools don't get, uh, teachers don't have to have a, um, a college degree to teach in those, but a lot of them do, um, but you don't have to. And it was those negative uh, aspects that were impacting um, the, the support or the non-support from our side of vouchers for, for students in North Carolina, public school kids to leave the public schools and go to a, a private school or a charter school. And the, the money, uh, if you leave the public schools uh, and go to a private school or a charter school, the money, if you decide you don't wanna stay there, you wanna come back into the public school, the money does not follow the student back into the public school. The, the private school and the charter schools got to keep the money. But that was one of them, and one of the issues I think that started. And I, I don't know, I think um, one thing that, that we both have, and that is we have a caucus that we belong to, um, the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus. And, um, you know, we, we have, is it a caucus vote or is it just vote how you want, vote your conscience? And there are key bills that are, that are caucus votes. And John knows that, both sides of the aisle, we have that. And so if it is a caucus vote, then everybody has to vote for it or against it. And those issues tend to divide because some members on both sides, if it's a caucus issue, they will say, well, sorry, but I'm gonna vote with the majority or sorry, I'm." feel strongly about this and I'm going to vote with the minority. So that that is another part that brings the divide back. Um, but it, it's interesting. And of course, leadership um, uh, determines, I think, uh, what uh, a caucus issue will be, what a caucus vote will be, and the, what the issue would be. Um, so I just think that being able to see through issues without getting the credit for it as a seated member, and you're willing to work with someone of the other side, the other party, um, that is where we're gonna have to start to 
not go at this is I've got this great burning issue and I'm gonna run it. Go find those colleagues as I have done, a Republican and a Democrat to join me and, and, the, um, and diversity on that, that sponsorship piece. John, what do you think about that? Do you largely agree? I do. I do agree. Uh, I should have listened to Becky a lot more early, my early years coming to the General Assembly. I've got more bills passed, but uh, my bill seemed to make it to the Senate rules chair and, and rest comfortably in the Senate. But uh, just kidding. A lot of it gets through, but I agree with her as that well. And it, I think it's kind of, to me, kind of made the water even gray and murkier this year is that from my, from my perspective, is that we have uh, three parties now in, in that, that's doing litigation. We have the, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and the judicial branch in North Carolina, where we have some of our judges doing things that really the Constitution says they're not to do, and that's left up to the General Assembly or the legislators to do. Well, I'll give you one example, no matter where you stand on this, but whether uh, the people of North Carolina, through a constitutional referendum, referendum some years ago voted to implement photo voter identification cards uh, that by I forget near 70 percent of the people in North Carolina I can't no might, might be near 60 percent of the people in North Carolina uh, and so it was it was being implemented and then one judge ended up saying that that wasn't constitutional so I scratched my head trying to figure out if something's actually in the constitution how is it no longer constitutional unless the people decide it is no longer constitutional similar to what they did with prohibition uh, at the national uh, federal level some years ago. If the people want it into constitution, it's the people that take it out. And, and now we have judges kind of messing with it. So I've got, I've got a problem with that. And I think we're actually, uh, I think we're very near, if not somewhat into a constitutional crisis to the point that uh, the different responsibilities for each legislative branch are becoming grayed, for example. Uh, we have Governor Cooper. I'm sure he's a fine individual. I don't know him that well, but you know he he's operated this last couple of years of, of his being a governor by by emergency de declarations. So there's some concern there too. Just how much power does the governor have through his emergency edicts, where he can put one out there and just let it ride off through an executive order? So we we were addressing some of those. Uh, it, it's just it's kind of odd right now. It's just an odd feeling. Used to those lines were extremely clear and responsibilities were concise. And now it seems like over the years they, they have somewhat muddied and, and, and grayed. So uh, hopefully we can get that straightened out in the coming years. Becky, what do you think about those concerns about the executive and judicial branch? Well, that's been one of those um, divisive issues, I think that has, has um, happened with um, it, and, and it has happened, taken, there've been bills filed that, that have passed from the majority side that uh, was stripped some of the powers from the governor. And that doesn't add to wanting to be able to work together. It, it was like a power grab. And um, when our, when Governor Cooper was first sworn in his first term, and before he was even sworn in, we had a call session and, and it started stripping away some of his powers around the board of, of, of election appointees. And, um, and that passed because um, any, anyway, take, you know, when you have, I think you have to have that balance of power. And I do think that there, there has to be that veto opportunity there. And uh, so that your governor can the, the veto a bill and then the two chambers um, either vote to sustain or override. And I've, that, that has, we've had, that was a, a big start. I do think that, um, you know, with our judicial branch, um, we've had so many um, challenges before the courts with legislation. Um, so we've seen that, um, that part of the three legs of government um, that's had a, a impact, um, and it seems like, you know, we, we're turning around and there's always a bill that's, that's being challenged that we've passed and it's being challenged. And, 
um, some have been um, upheld by the court or, or, or not. And I think that it's something we should all be cognizant of and, and expect and respect the, the different uh, charges for the different branches of government. Mm. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up here. I really commend each of you on your work and, and your approach. And I think elected officials, particularly at the federal level, could really learn a, a thing or two from how you guys approach these conversations and try to work together for the common good, particularly when these national issues start to rear their heads locally. So I appreciate both of you guys coming on and I'm sure Braver Angels will be reaching out to you again uh, to produce subsequent events. So thank you both so much. Well, Take care. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I know, I know he wants to end, but I do wanna just say this. Um, braver angels, um, what a great term, <laughs> uh, but I will tell you, I, when you Google my name, you've probably, numerous people have done it. John's freshman year, there was a major vote on the floor at midnight, and it was around the fracking issue, and I had been a no vote all along. John Torbett and um, uh, his seatmate in front of me and my seatmate, um, <clears throat> I hit the wrong button and we have a, a toggle button, green or red. And I was a no vote and I punched the button. It was late at night and it, I looked over and I went, oh my God, it's green. And I went to punch it to red. My machine had been locked. I still had seconds left on the clock to vote. And my, my seatmate was saying, grab the microphone and get the speaker's attention, call the speaker's attention. My uh, seatmate in front of me, John Torbett, jumped up, ran up to the front to get the speaker's attention to tell him my uh, switch had been locked and I'd, I had voted the wrong way. But there was a, a reason that it was locked. And from there, I was the deciding vote on a horrible vote that took place in, um, in the state, in my opinion, my vote was robbed that night, but I do know <coughs> John that credit that he jumped to run up there, but for it was too late. They had already called the vote and they did a, a clincher uh, motion and I was a clincher vote motion and I was locked out. But those are, those are relationships that you know that you need to build on. And I would say that to people in Congress. When someone is being wronged, and you're on the other in the other party, and you know it, and you don't speak up. You're adding to the problems that we have in the country today, and so I respect John for that a lot. And and he knew everybody everybody in that chamber knew they knew me, but I was robbed of that vote. But I just needed to add that because um, it was quite a night, and so. John, I've told you that a million times, but I really appreciate that. It was a great move. Thank you, Becky. And I'd just like to say in closing too, also, when you hear people talking about how angry we are back and forth, don't believe it. Just, just I guess, to see if they're profiting from, from creating that anger or stirring the pot. I think most times you'll see that they are. So, uh, you know, we get along great in Raleigh. Uh, we always speak to each other. We work on a lot of bills. And there may be been one or two would, would I might have told Becky I can't go there. There's probably a couple of Becky said I can't go there, but collectively we still work together. And because I mean we're humans and that's what we're supposed to do. So thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Look forward to the next one. Thank you. All, all. right. Thank you guys. Uh huh.